supposed to do this introduction. It was supposed to be Judge Christopher Bowen, but he unfortunately is caught in traffic. So I'm going to do my best to introduce Vaughn Walker to you, um, and I know his, um, his speech will be wonderful. Um, briefly, he was a federal judge for the United States District Court for the um, Northern District of California. He became a member of that court in 1989 after being nominated by George H.W. Bush. He served as chief judge of the court from 2004 to 2010 and stepped down from the court on February 28, 2011. He's a native of Illinois, graduated from the University of Michigan with a bachelor's degree in 1966, and then later graduated from Stanford Law School in 1970. He served as a law clerk for federal judge Robert Keller in the United States District Court for the Central District of California from 1971 to 1972, before spending the rest of his pre-judicial legal career as a private practicing attorney in California from 72 to 1990. On recommendation from Governor Pete Wilson, he was nominated um, by George Bush on September 7, 1989 to vacate a seat held by Spencer Williams. He was confirmed on November 21st on unanimous consent and received commission on November 27, 1989. Okay, I think we all know what um, Judge Walker will be talking about today, and uh, it might be Proposition 8, but um, maybe he's going to talk about our long-standing friendship and how he remembers all the times I appeared in front of him as a young attorney who didn't know what she was doing. Um, he was very gracious always, and as chair of the Diversity Committee, we are absolutely honored that he could join us here today. Oh. Okay, come on, come on here. Um, Judge Bowen has arrived, so I'm going to let him say just a few words because you came all this way. Please give him a hand. He came all the way from where he So the burning question of the hour is, can a retired uh, federal judge still impose sanctions for being late? <laughs> Good afternoon, and I, I will never again try to uh, take a jury verdict uh, and drive to uh, Walnut Creek from Richmond on a rainy Friday afternoon. Uh, it just doesn't work in the same lot of period. I do apologize. Um, I did some research about Judge Walker, uh, and these are the sound bites that I got. A bit of an iconoclast on the federal bench, a stickler for procedure, fair, an excellent trial judge, pleasure to appear before. Uh, this is from one of my colleagues who, uh, for the moment, will remain nameless, my colleagues on the bench. Uh, the first judge who ever said no when I asked to approach. <laughs> the same judge uh, said of Judge Walker, quite a gentleman, polite. Uh, the jury really liked him. Another colleague uh, who was a securities litigator um, was absolutely thrilled because apparently Judge Walker granted an injunction against an insider trader. Uh, but this judge also noted uh, that Judge Walker um, was a stickler for procedure and took copious notes on every uh, procedural error or um, misstep you might have taken. And if you were not prepared, you had better be prepared uh, to respond to Judge Walker's inquiry about those matters. Judge Walker. Uh, attended the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor as an undergraduate and graduated with distinction and high honors. He was a Woodrow Wilson Fellow at the University of California at Berkeley. He received his law degree from Stanford. He clerked for the Honorable uh, Judge Robert J. Kelleher of the United States District Court for the Central District of California, Los Angeles. Uh, for many years, uh, Judge Walker was an associate and then partner at Pillsbury Madison and Sutro in San Francisco. He was a distinguished litigator who was lead counsel for numerous cases that uh, resulted in published decisions, both federal and state. Judge Walker was on the uh, uh, district court for the Northern District of California from 1990 through 2011. He was chief uh, judge of the district from 2004 through 2010. Uh, since his retirement, no grass has grown under his feet. He has uh, lectured at Stanford and at uh, Berkeley School of Law. 
Uh, and he's currently a, an attorney in private practice uh, with the law office of Vaughn R. Walker. Uh, he has received numerous awards and honors, including the Outstanding Jurist Award from the World Computer Law Congress, uh, and he has been a distinguished guest lecturer on numerous occasions. His decisions uh, as a federal judge ran the full gamut of just about every uh, area of law that you could imagine. Civil liberties, national security, technology, antitrust, securities, class actions. Judge Walker uh, presided over a little known case uh, called Perry versus Schwarzenegger, which was decided in 2010. It's received almost no coverage in the press, <laughs> and I'm sure none of you has ever heard of it. Uh, and in that case, of course, the state prohibition, uh, constitutional prohibition against the recognition of same-sex marriage uh, was found to be unconstitutional. Judge Walker will be speaking to you this afternoon about the dynamics of a high-profile case on behalf of the Contra Costa Becker County Bar Association, the diversity section, the diversity committee. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Judge Vaughn Walker. sanctions <laughs> now that I'm a retired judge, but inasmuch as I am between you and cocktails, the sanctions may in this case And I hope that I bear that in mind, that circumstance of where I stand in all of this. Uh, judge Bowen's articulation of some of the things that I've done on the bench before uh, he didn't specifically mention complex litigation. It is true that over the years I handled a number of cases, quite a number of cases that were complex. We have a random assignment system in the Northern District of California, as is true in the federal district courts around the country. So you would think that complex cases would not gravitate toward one judge as opposed to the others. But I found a way to overcome that <laughs> The case may not have been complex when it was filed. <laughs> I can assure you after I had it a while, it was complex. <laughs> and Casey Christensen, who was good enough almost 20 years ago, I guess 18 years ago, to uh, be an extern in my chambers is here. And so he can speak firsthand on how we managed to accomplish that. Now my assignment, as I understand it, is to talk about some of the dynamics of high-profile cases. And what I'm going to tell you this afternoon is not anything that you probably haven't already thought about yourself, probably don't already know. It may or may not be helpful to be reminded of some of these things, however. And it's also true that I'm going to be speaking largely from a judge's perspective, but I'm going to try to tease out some lessons that I think lawyers should be cognizant of about such cases and some of the dynamics of such cases for two reasons. Number one, because it may be helpful in their own practices, and number two, it's always helpful for a lawyer to have some idea of what's going on behind the bench, what some of the thoughts are and some of the pressures are that are brought to bear on a judge in a high profile case. Now, in the past when I've given talks on high profile cases, I've usually followed the introduction with a slide, PowerPoint slide, pointing out that high profile trials are not new. They've been around for a long time. And so the first slide is almost invariably the trial of Socrates. <laughs> These trials have a similarity over the years. I don't have a PowerPoint here today, but it is important to point out the observation that we're not talking about anything that's new or basically anything that's different. It's been around for a long time. There are certain cases for particular reasons which pique the public's interest or which generate the public's interest. 
and they run the gamut. The public interest may stem from a whole variety of different sources. It may have to do with the public's interest in the issues that the case involves. This was certainly the situation with the Proposition 8 case and the <coughs> National Security Agency cases that Judge Bowen uh, mentioned in the introduction. It may have to do with the celebrity or notoriety of one or more of the trial participants. This was certainly the situation in the Barry Bonds case that my former colleague Susan Ilston tried very recently, and which I'll talk about a little bit more in a few moments. And I really don't need to remind you of some of the names associated with those kind of trials. Casey Hill, <coughs> Anna Nicole Smith, Lindsay Lohan, Robert Blake, Michael Jackson, Scooter Libby, Kobe Bryant, Martha Stewart, Bob Blagojevich. These names, of course, we all know simply because they were involved in certain cases, and those cases that involved those individuals attracted a high profile. And it may have to do with some exceptional nature of the proceedings that generates the public interest. The gubernatorial recall litigation of a few years back, the reapportionment litigation in the 80s, I was involved in that as a lawyer, that attracts a lot of public attention and a high profile. And it may have to do because of the particular nature of the issues involved, think of the immigration case that Judge Susan Bolton in Arizona recently tried, or the log cabin Republicans case challenging the don't ask, don't tell policy that Judge Jenny Phillips in Southern California tried. And it may have to do with the outcome of the case, or the anticipated outcome of the case. For example, in the Oracle merger case, Aside several years ago, and the Apple Microsoft case involving the graphical features of the Windows interface, uh, it was thought that the outcome of those litigations would affect people's jobs, employment opportunities with particular companies, and indeed the fate of certain companies. And I think it's fair to say that that assessment is correct and that that generated uh, public interest public interest that's generated in one of these kinds of cases uh, can be quite different, one kind of case from the other. But there are certain similarities that kind of run through all of these cases once the case reaches a certain high profile. We also know that for the most part, what we do as lawyers, judges, does not attract a lot of attention. It's not a high profile. It's of interest, of course, to the parties. It's of interest to the lawyers. Usually, we hope it's of interest to the judge. Occasionally, it may even be of interest to the jurors. <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part, we don't have to deal with the problems associated and that are peculiar to those kinds of cases where there is intense public focus on the case and the participants. So, as there are various ways in which public interest in the proceeding tends to shine a light uh, in ways that are atypical of most litigation, the vast bulk of our work does not attract that kind of attention. And it may very well be that we as judges and lawyers may slip occasionally into habits or activities or a frame of mind that's more attuned to trying a case in the relative serenity and privacy of most courtrooms than it is in a case that's full of reporters that has the intense light of public interest and uh, attention drawn to it. And there's another aspect of high profile cases that we should bear in mind in thinking about what lessons are to be learned from it's important to remember that the public interest in high-profile cases is sometimes very fleeting. It is almost invariably superficial, and it is frequently ill-informed, and on occasion, even motivated by an intent to disrupt or in some way to contaminate the proceedings. So with that background, 
let me tease out, if I can, four lessons that I think should be helpful to judges and lawyers in dealing with such cases. Lesson number one, lower the temperature. A judge charged with handling a high-profile trial needs to be firmly in control of the proceedings. And the lawyers should do nothing to disrupt that judicial control. No matter the irritation and the heartburn that some lawyers inflict on the judge, and believe me, the lawyers do inflict heartburn <laughs> on judges from time to time, um, a cool judge goes a long way to setting the right atmosphere in the case. And no matter the irritation and heartburn that some judges inflict on lawyers, and some judges indeed inflict heartburn on lawyers, lawyers ill serve their clients and they ill serve the administration of justice by trying to take control of the courtroom. The judge should be in control of the courtroom and actually that is beneficial, not just for the judge, not just for the appearance of the proceedings, it's beneficial to the orderly disposition of the litigation. And the best way, I think, for the judge to lower the temperature is for the judge to do the job the judges are there to do, setting a reasonable but firm schedule and sticking to it. Look at the example of Judge Ilson in the very last case. That was a case that had all kinds of distractions, a major distraction, maybe even the principal distraction, being the interlocutory appeal that the government pursued from one of Judge, Judge Ilston's evidentiary rulings, which delayed matters and created the opportunity for a lot of additional publicity and all kinds of distractions associated with the case. <coughs> Judge Ilston never let any of that interfere with her efficient uh, handling of the case. She ran the trial when it finally came to trial with a minimum of fuss and upset. And at no point did she lose her cool. She ruled on motions promptly, held a number of case management conferences with the lawyers to deal with logistical issues. And when the case was finally back in her courtroom after the detour to the Ninth Circuit on the interlocutory appeal, and ultimately an unsuccessful appeal, uh, she set a firm but sensible schedule and held to it. The trial started, it ran like a well-oiled machine. Judge Ilston selected the jury in less than one day. A marked contrast to the distended jury selection process that we've seen in some other cases. She never lost control. Indeed, if there's anything that gets a jury case off to a bad start, this is true in any case, I think, but it's particularly true in a high-profile case, it is a protracted jury selection process because it inevitably involves a lot of collateral issues and brings a focus on the personalities of the trial participants in a way that many other aspects of the trial do not. Now, this will not be popular with lawyers, but I must tell you that after 21 years on the bench, several years as a lawyer before that, I am no fan of lawyer conducted voir dire. It usually is a colossal waste of time. <laughs> it is seldom, I'm uh, going to be unvarnished, it is seldom that lawyers get anything worthwhile in the voir dire process. And judges can get information from jurors a lot more easily. So if there is some line of inquiry that you really do feel needs to be pursued, test a particular juror, to test that juror's preconceived ideas about the case or issues pertaining to it. If at all possible, see if you can get the judge to ask these questions. And if the judge does permit attorney voir dire, use it sparingly, sparingly. And use it, and this is of course not limited to high profile cases, but use open-ended questions with the members of the panel. Tell us, Mr. Jones, about leaving your employment at XYZ Company to take a job elsewhere. Let the, let the juror, the prospective juror, tell you the story. Don't try to 
frame the juror's answer. Yes, Ms. Smith, what would you like to see in a juror in a case where you were a party? Let the juror talk and give you the information. Friendly, non-confrontational. That's, that's, I think, good advice in any case, and particularly in a case where your treatment of the jury is going to be front and center, as it is in a high-profile case. Now, what to do when the judge doesn't do what you think is necessary, is not well prepared, and doesn't pursue inquiries that you regard as important and identify a juror has some leaning that prejudges the case. Well, as I said, first ask the judge to pursue the question. If the judge doesn't do so, or doesn't do so in a way that you think is appropriate, you do have to make your record. And usually, I think, the situation would be if the four year process is still ongoing, if it hasn't completed, if it hasn't finished, the judge can be persuaded to ask the question or pursue the inquiry that you feel is, is absolutely necessary. Now, as I said, these are pretty standard things to think about in every case. In a high profile case, you need to obtain some sense whether the potential juror can stand up to the kind of scrutiny a high profile case is likely to generate. That's really the unique issue that confronts jury selection in a high profile case. As I said, there was really nothing known about the way that Judge Ilston handled the Barry Bonds case. And there was nothing that she did in that case that shouldn't be done in every case, one way or the other. Prompt rulings, reasonable and firm schedule. Those will do wonders in any case. It's simply much harder to execute these good case management practices in the high profile case because of the tension, the tension that such a case has. Lawyers and parties often perceive that they have more to lose in a high profile case. Hence, their incentives to resist the inevitable consequences of firm scheduling are often greater in the high profile case. And that enhances the importance of good case management in a high profile case. I'm not sure that that is a correct assessment, however, that lawyers have more to lose by resisting the kind of fundamental and good case management practices that Judge Ilston had very much on display in the Barry Bonds case. So it is true that much of the responsibility for managing a high profile case does fall on the judge's shoulders. But there's a lot that lawyers can do to keep the temperature cool or at least at a low grade fever in the case. First, lawyers need to know that if the case becomes a fiasco, they will share the blame. And the need may be the biggest part of the blame. Good manners are important in every case, but manners are on vivid display in the high profile case. So a lawyer's self-interest in an orderly proceeding Proceedings go off the rails, no one looks good, even if you're not the cause of the derailment. Second, lawyers need to recognize the pressures that a judge is under in a high profile case, and they should avoid anything that is likely to cause the judge to make a mistake that will, in some fashion or other, derail the proceedings. Third, while lawyers too can be under a great deal of pressure on a high profile case, cooperation with the other side is of even greater importance in a high profile case. I've had lawyers say that they don't want to appear friendly with the adversary in a case where everybody is looking. It seems to me that is exactly the wrong attitude. You do want to look like a professional who is cooperative with the other side in a case where everybody is watching. Not that you don't want to in every case, but it's a lot of importance, I think, in a high profile case. Well, those are just good practices generally, but they're much more important in a high profile case because of the stakes. Lesson number two, open the courtroom. I doubt that if we went around the room, many of you would disagree with what I've said in lesson number one. But you may very well disagree with a lot of this. Maybe the attorney board here I've got some disagreement on, but probably, or at least many will disagree with this. 
By definition, a high-profile trial is a proceeding of public interest. So the job of handling a high-profile case involves handling that public interest. Chief Justice Berger wrote some years ago that people in an open society do not demand infallibility in their institutions, but it is difficult for them to seek to accept what they are prohibited from observing. Now, the problem in the federal trial courts, this is not as much of a problem in the state courts, but the problem in the federal trial courts, the United States Supreme Court, and most of the courts of appeal, unfortunately in the Ninth Circuit, is that the public is, a, is as a practical matter, prohibited from viewing the proceedings. <coughs> Rules and practices for closing broadcast and video or internet posting of court proceedings is tantamount to a prohibition of public access. How many people can actually go down to the courthouse and sit hour after hour after hour in the entire proceedings? Very few. So they rely upon second, third, fourth, and accounts. Now I realize that courtroom cameras have acquired a bad name among some and perhaps many in our profession. This is unfortunate and I think an ill-deserved disrepute that has carried over to the federal courts and perhaps even more unfortunately to the Supreme Court of the United States itself. There is light, or at least a tube of some kind, at the end of the tunnel. And the Ninth Circuit is ahead of the other circuits in allowing access by the broadcast media. In fact, the Ninth Circuit was the first circuit to do so. It was a case in 1991. It was a panel consisting of Clifford Wallace, Thomas Nelson, and Oliver Kelch. They allowed C-SPAN and three television stations to broadcast an appellate oral argument. None of those three judges, those of you who know them, would identify any of them as radicals in anything, and certainly not in terms of judicial management. And in the years since, there have been, in the Ninth Circuit, 260 Ninth Circuit appellate arguments broadcast, including the one that the Supreme Court just decided yesterday that I understand that the Justice spoke about the argument in the Proposition 8 case that was on the certified question from the Ninth Circuit. In 2007, the Ninth Circuit Judicial Conference authorized broadcast of federal trial court proceedings. That was a resolution that was overwhelmingly adopted on the vote of both the judges and the lawyers at that Ninth Circuit Judicial Conference. It was not immediately implemented because at the time the administrative office of the courts, or at least the case administration committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States, was looking into a nationwide pilot program. And the Ninth Circuit, I think, wisely decided they didn't want to get too far out in front of the nationwide program. And so they did not do anything to implement, or did very little to implement the program. Uh, for some period of time. Then, of course, the Proposition 8 case came along, which seemed to me and to others to be a perfect case for broadcast because it involved, obviously, issues of keen and widespread interest, excellent lawyers on both sides. It was a non-jury case, so we didn't have problems associated with the coverage of uh, a case in which jurors are called upon to be exposed it seemed to have all the perfect ingredients for broadcast. Well, I won't go into, of course, all the circumstances, but you all know that through a series of rather unusual circumstances, the United States Supreme Court intervened not to prohibit broadcast, but to prohibit transmission of the proceedings outside of the courthouse. That was the only issue that was before the Supreme Court. And interestingly enough, <coughs> the Supreme Court acknowledged in its opinion that which had been known and recognized and never really teased out as clearly as it was in this case, that the Supreme Court itself, either directly or indirectly through the Judicial Conference, does not have the authority <coughs> to prohibit broadcast of 
trial proceedings or any other proceedings in the lower federal courts. That expression, lower federal courts, is one that I've never liked to particularly well. <laughs> <laughs> the Supreme Court of the United States. But putting that aside, uh, the Supreme Court did recognize that they did not have the authority to do so. In the particular Prop 8 case, they hung their hat on what they considered to be the defects in the adoption of the local rule that implemented the program, something that now the Northern District of California has taken care of with the adoption of what is now Local Rule 77-3. But the good news, or from my point of view, the good news that's come out of this is that that experience helped to revive interest in Congress in the subject of cameras in the courtroom. And in September, the Judicial Conference of the United States approved a, this was September of last year, uh, in September of last year they approved a three-year pilot program for broadcast of civil trials in selected districts. The guidelines are set out in, uh, in uh, regulations that have been issued by the Judicial Conference. There are many limitations with this pilot project, and it's a tentative start, but it is a movement in the right direction. So I think we are at least moving haltingly toward opening these proceedings. Now you might wonder why I should think that opening these proceedings, broadcasting, making them more available to people in a high profile case would be helpful. You would you might initially think, well, this is simply going to raise the temperature. It's not going to lower the temperature. I think that's incorrect. Here's why I think it's incorrect. First. We've all seen the kind of coverage that occurs in high-profile cases. Images on the television news of people coming and going to the courthouse with whatever they're coming and going to the courthouse from. And sometimes in various states, of various circumstances. These images of the lawyers and the parties crowding through onlookers in the midst of demonstrations sometimes outside the courthouse hardly is a scene of judicial tranquility and calm. The images that are sketched by the sketch artists of the proceedings hardly reflect the kind of image that you would associate with an orderly trial proceeding. And from a lawyer's point of view, I believe that lawyers would find that broadcast of the proceedings themselves would be sanitary. It would lower the intense pressure on lawyers to be making statements to the media before or after the trial, before or after the proceedings. I'm not saying for a moment that the media will not ask questions. The media will not try to get a story. Of course they will. But you will have a ready answer when you're asked, what about this evidence? What about this testimony? What about this side of the other thing? And you can simply say, look, you saw what happened. And your viewers can see what happened in court. You don't need me to tell you what happened. I think it would get you as lawyers off the hook of having to serve as part-time public relations individuals, as spinners of the story in a way that hasn't been fully understood. In any event, I don't know whether you agree with that or not, but in any event, that's what I think would be a step in the right direction. Okay, lesson number three. Make nice to the media. Now, make no mistake about it, <coughs> the media are not your friends. <laughs> Especially in the Bible file case. But, they're not exactly your enemy. So don't treat them as such. The media, of course, are looking for the man dog, my man, uh, lights dog story, of course. And it's generally easy, much easier for the judge to decline talking to the media or dealing with the media in a high profile case because the media folks almost invariably understand the limitations on what a judge can say or do with respect to a case that uh, the judge presiding over. That is not anything that 
the lawyers can rely upon, of course. A judge in a high-profile case can do a lot of things to help both himself or herself and the lawyers maintain a cordial relationship with the media and get a reasonably accurate story of the proceedings out. First, and if the judge doesn't do these things on himself uh, or herself on own initiative, there's no reason why the lawyers cannot suggest these things. And probably such suggestions would be appreciated by most judges. First, appoint someone on the court staff to interface with the media. Best, of course, is somebody who's unflappable, somebody who understands something about the news business. In the Northern District of California, we had for a number of years a person whose uncle had been a longtime reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle. She grew up in a household where there were newspaper people. She knew the business and she knew lots of the ways that media look at stories and she was understanding of their needs and uh, also the limitations. Uh, they were operating, operating under. And she proved to be a wonderful point person in the clerk's office in dealing with the media. And that relieved the lawyers of a good deal of the necessity for interaction with the media. Secondly, an overflow of courtroom in which the trial proceedings are transmitted is extremely helpful. Most reporters prefer to watch the proceedings in the overflow courtroom than in the courtroom itself because they can come and go as they like. They can pound on their laptops, and they can talk to others, and they, can, they have a lot of flexibility uh, in the overflow courtroom that they do not have in the courtroom itself. And in, in the Prop 8 trial, for example, we established a ticketing system to ration the limited seats in the courtroom and set aside a certain number for the media representatives who did prefer to be in the courtroom itself. The ticketing system worked extremely extremely well in that case. And we had no empty seats in the 13 days of trial. Another very useful step we took was to alert the press and the parties in advance of the issuance of rulings. This is very helpful to the lawyers. And if the judge doesn't uh, suggest it or uh, otherwise indicate that he or she's going to do it, there's no reason why the lawyers could not suggest to the judge that the lawyers be given an advance look at the orders or the rulings as they are uh, issued, either an hour, two hours, maybe a day ahead, whatever. I noticed that uh, the California Supreme Court has, for several years, been in the habit of at least alerting the lawyers that the decision is going to issue on such and such a date. We went even further in only the Prop 8 case, but other cases, and that is giving the lawyers copies of the orders in advance of the actual filing of the orders. Sometimes a matter of hours, sometimes a matter of 24 hours. The advantage of that is, of course, that the lawyers have the order. They have what it is that they're going to be asked about. They are not having to answer the media's question on the fly. They can give a more complete response and a much better informed response than they can uh, with uh, out advance notice. The, uh, the deadlines in the media business these days are down to minutes, not days and certainly not even hours anymore. So it's important that the lawyers and the trial participants have enough information about what the court is doing so that they can respond meaningfully to the media. Now, as I said, lawyers have a much harder time of avoiding media contact than does the judge. But there are a few simple rules, I think. First, don't let the press talk to your client without being present. And indeed, keep your client away from the media if you can altogether. Second, try to know the reporter who you're talking to. Will the reporter abide by the rule that what's off the record stays off the record? Or will the reporter not do so? Third, remember that the judge will likely read or see what you say about the case to the media, and the same goes for the jury. No matter how many instructions are given to the jury about not reading 
newspaper reports or listening to radio or television. The chances are what appears in the media is going to be seen by the judge, it's going to be seen by the jury. You simply have to recognize that. And fourth, if you do talk to the media, make sure your comments are consistent with the theme of your case and the evidence of the trial. Lesson number four, rise above. The judge handling the high-profile case will try not to get in the way of the case or the media story about the case. This means, in my view, that what's going on in the judge's life outside the courtroom and in other cases, the duties the judge is fulfilling should stay out of the case at hand. The judge may be criticized in the media, may receive threats of violence or intimidation related to the case, and may encounter well-meaning friends and acquaintances who want to draw the judge out about the case. The judge should certainly rise above this and act in the courtroom as if the case at hand is the only matter uh, on the judge's mind. And these same basic principles apply to lawyers. We all need to remember that a case, even a high-profile case, that involves explosive issues is not about the lawyers, it's not about the judge. In some cases and at some times, a lawyer's tactics and skills will be called into question by the press, by commentators, or the public. The law professors, I've found, who respond to media inquiries are sometimes pretty wide of the mark in commenting on the proceedings. And because they're identified with an institution that would suggest learning on these subjects, more attention is paid to these comments than they think they are worth. And it's not entirely the fault of these professors who are called upon to comment. They may not be given the full story, they may not have access to all of the information, they may be responding to an inquiry in the press that doesn't paint the complete and full picture of the situation. But you simply have to deal with the possibility that there will be comments from individuals who are supposedly very credible, who are making statements that are difficult for you to deal with. So I realize that applying some of these lessons in the context of a case where the pressure is high, where the scrutiny is intense, where the stakes are consequential, calls upon your very best instincts, both professionally and personally. And there will undoubtedly be irritations, there will undoubtedly be disappointments in these kinds of cases, no less than in any other kind of case. These are really the cases that test your metal as professionals, not so much in your skills as a lawyer, not so much in the sterling quality of your advocacy, but test you in a way going to your character. And that character stands out in a high profile situation. You just want to be sure that when you're in that kind of a situation, the best of your character does come out. And I'm sure if you think about all of the other participants in the proceedings, particularly thinking of it from the point of view not just of your case, but of the integrity of the judicial process and how this enterprise that we as lawyers and judges are involved in works, that will be your lodestar to doing the right thing. Thank you. <laughs>